So welcome to week six of the Online Academy. This week, we're going to discuss the features and benefits of clinical therapeutic seating. The features and benefits of clinical therapeutic seating are based around the four principles of good sitting. Now we've discussed these before, but just to recap, the four principles of good sitting are to load the body, to provide postural support, to allow effective repositioning, and to use an appropriate surface or an appropriate cushion. So all of the principles of good sitting are interlinked into the features and the benefits. So the first feature I want to talk about is adjustability. Every chair, every clinical therapeutic chair needs to be adjustable. And why do we need it to be adjustable? To meet the needs of the, of the changing needs of the client, because the client's needs will change over the period of time they're using the chair to enable the chair to be used in a multi-care environment and to allow loan stores to recycle the chairs. So we're going to look at some of the adjustability features. So the first feature is seat height and foot plate height adjustment. So why is that important? It meets the needs of several users. It reduces the risk of sliding from the chair. It reduces the risk of posterior tilt and remember that the feet take 19% of the body weight, so it's essential that the feet are loaded. So adjustability of seat height and foot plate height is number one. So the next feature is the adjustment of the calf pad and the leg rest. And the adjustability of it is essential to accommodate hamstrings. The angle of the leg rest must always match the angle that's achievable at the knee without causing resistance. You may need to have the, the angle negative to accommodate someone with very tight hamstrings. And it also should have the ability to lock out the leg rest so that somebody with tight hamstrings does, is not able to elevate the leg rest. The next feature is the foot plate uh, angle. And that is dorsal and plantar flexion. And it's important that you accommodate that because loading the feet is really important. Too much pressure on the ball of the foot can cause an increase in tonal patterns. So by loading the feet properly, using the angle adjustment at the, at the foot plate, we are able to uh, spread the weight through the full foot. Uh, also, adjustability means that it will meet the needs of several different users. The next adjustment is seat depth adjustment. So why is that essential? It will meet the needs of varying clients with different leg lengths. Uh, adjustment properly will reduce sliding from the chair and reduces the risk of posterior tilt. And if there's a leg length discrepancy, we always adjust the seat depth to accommodate the shorter leg. Seat width. Why is that essential? Why do we need adjustability in seat width? Because if we're recycling the chair, it meets the needs of users with various hip widths. Adjusting the seat width encourages a midline position. So you need to have the arms nice and close to the body so that it encourages a midline position. The rule of thumb is that you have the width of your hand at each side of the trochanters. If it's too wide, you're going to cause a pelvic obliquity. So it needs to accommodate any fixed deformities. If it's too narrow, it will cause friction and shear and risk of skin damage. And it, if you can move the arms of the chair out, it can assist with sling application. So a variation in seat width is a really good feature on any clinical therapeutic chair. Next feature, back angle recline. Now we've talked a lot about this in previous uh, webinars about the importance of adjusting the back angle to suit the hip angle. So that's vital. If you open out the back angle to match the hip angle, you're going to reduce sliding from the chair and avoid posterior pelvic tilt. It is vital to accommodate hamstrings. And just today, I got a question about that from an earlier webinar. That, uh, and because the hamstrings go over the hip joint, and the knee joint. You need to accommodate the hamstrings at the hip as well as the knee. And this is where the adjustability in the angle of the back is essential in any clinical therapeutic seat. 
It enables a more functional position for clients with fixed deformities. Used on its own, it may cause shear and friction, so it should always be used in association with tilting space. Because when you open up the back angle of a chair, you can cause the person to slide. So if you use it in association with tilt, you put the centre of gravity behind and that stabilises the body. You also, a clinical chair should have the ability to lock out the back angle because you don't want somebody coming along and moving the back angle up when the client doesn't have the hip flexion to tolerate that. A fixed back chair should not be considered in a therapeutic seat. The next feature is tilt and space. And as you can see from this diagram, tilt and space redistributes the pressure. It takes the pressure off the vulnerable bony areas and redistributes the pressure onto the back. Tilt and space allows for easier change of position, either by the carer or by the person in the chair. It can decrease fatigue and improve energy, and therefore time spent in the chair can be increased. It can improve posture, head control and trunk control, and prevent sliding, and enables a more functional position. So every clinical therapeutic seat should have tilt and space as a feature and have the ability to make it adjustable. So the next feature is head support and postural support. You'll see my photograph of Billy. You've met Billy before. He's got a marked kyphosis and it's essential that the chair is adjustable to meet the particular needs of your patient. So having a head support and postural support, it encourages a midline position. It can correct a flexible deformity or accommodate a fixed deformity. It reduces the destructive forces at work on the body. It can stabilize the body and facilitates function. Now the next feature of adjustability is the arm height and whilst the arms only take 2% while we're sitting in that normal position, correct positioning of the arms is essential to gain midline posture and it increases the stability and the function within the chair. And as you can see from my photograph here, this lady, the armrests are too far away and they're too low down and she's not able to use them and therefore she's in a very non-functional position. So whilst the armrests only take 2% of the weight, they are essential for a good midline position and also to increase stability and to improve function in the chair. So that's the adjustability of the chair, the, the clinical features that should be adjustable in the chair. The next important uh, aspect of clinical seating is that it needs to be compatible with a patient lifter or a hoist. I know some of you talk about patient lifts, patient lifters or hoists, but we all mean the same thing. Uh, all clinical therapeutic seating should be compatible with any lifter, either the stand aid, the Sarah stand aid, a stand hoist or a full hoist. So the next important feature of any clinical therapeutic seating is infection control. All clinical therapeutic seating should adhere to the protocols of infection control. So what should we be looking for? The material should be water and stain resistant. It should be capable of withstanding disinfection with a chlorine based disinfectant. And it should be vinyl, which is durable and robust. And also the Dartex material for patient contact surfaces. And I would just like to clarify the, the vinyl and the Dartex because when we did the presentation earlier on infection control, I got a question about clients sitting on vinyl. And that is not something we would recommend. We believe that the chairs should have a vinyl covering on the areas that are not load bearing, but that the areas where there's patient contact or there's weight bearing, the, the material should be a Dartex type material, which is stretchable and allows for immersion and envelopment. So it's vitally important that all patient contact surfaces are made from a Dartex type material. This is the same material that is used on mattresses. So what other uh, properties should we be considering when we think of infection control in clinical therapeutic setting? So if you have a modular chair, it's much easier to clean because you can move the arms out, you can take the cushion off and you can get into all the nooks and crannies that might cause entrapment of infection. Also, we don't recommend Velcro 
because pathogens and bacteria tends to stick to the Velcro and is very difficult to clean. No fabrics because we believe that vinyl is much easier to clean because they harbour pathogens and the fabrics are difficult to clean. So the next feature of clinical therapeutic seating is pressure management. This is vitally important that the chair that the person is sitting in is providing them with pressure management for the time that they're in the chair. We tend to think about pressure management in the bed and the mattress, but we bring someone out to sit on the chair and we don't really consider the principles of pressure management. So the first one is pressure and shear reducing materials on all patient contact surfaces. For example, the Dartex material. Because the Dartex material allows for immersion and envelopment. It stabilizes the pelvis. It's breathable and water resistant. It reduces microclimate. And vinyl should not be used on the areas where the body is loading. And that's a really important sentence there. Vinyls should not be used on the areas where the body is loading because vinyl does not allow for immersion and envelopment. So what is immersion and envelopment? Immersion is the cushion needs to be deep enough to allow the pelvis to sit down and to emerge into the fabric and to the surface. And envelopment is the ability of the surface to conform or mold around the body requirements. Uh, poor envelopment leads to high interface pressure. So another feature uh, for design for pressure management is a removable seat cushion. So why is that important? Because it allows for the cushion upgrade without affecting the dimensions of a chair. You never put a cushion on top of a cushion because that causes instability and sliding. And it affects the dimensions of the chair. It means the arms are not reachable and maybe it affects the seat height. Also, a removable seat cushion allows for the cushion to be reviewed and replaced regularly without having to actually replace the full chair. So an integrated cushion, if it becomes no longer functional, then the chair becomes useless. Whereas if you have a removable seat cushion, you can actually re replace the cushion without having to replace the chair. What I want to demonstrate is how important it is to not put a cushion on top of a cushion. So here I am seated in the monocle chair. My arms are loaded, my feet are loaded, and I'm very secure in this chair. But now someone has decided I need a pressure cushion. So I'm going to demonstrate what happens when you put a cushion on top of an existing cushion. So now you can see how this changes. My feet are no longer loaded, my arms are not supported, and I would tend to lean to one side really to get stability. By adding the cushion on top of the cushion, you're making the body unstable. And when the body's unstable, it's less functional. And what will happen over time is that the body will start to slide because the cushion on top of the cushion will cause sliding. So I'm going to demonstrate what, how beneficial it is to have a removable seat cushion. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to take out the existing cushion and I'm going to add in the specialised, this is a Rojo, so a specialised cushion. So I'm going to add in a cushion. So you can see now that my feet are loaded, my arms are in the correct position, and that by adding the pressure cushion, I have not changed the dimensions of the chair. So this is the benefit of having a removable seat cushion on all clinical therapeutic seating. I think a lot of you will know the benefits of tilt and space and we've done some research around this and we were with Ulster University and what we came up with was is tilt and space that the 45 degree is the most the beneficial position for offloading the ITs and for repositioning. 30 degree tilt will increase function and facilitates function but 45 degree tilt is essential to offload the bony areas. So tilt and space is a really good feature and a very important feature in pressure management. Also, opening up the back angle of the chair increases comfort, uh, redistributes pressure, uh, but it can cause shear and friction if used alone. So we always use recline in association with tilt. 
I'm going to very quickly mention a few features of bariatric seating, but I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail because it's a whole area on its own, which I'm going to cover in a later webinar. But just to say that bariatric seating, it's not just about getting a wider chair. There are other things that we need to consider when we think of bariatric seating. And I will cover these in more detail in a future webinar. But one of the features is removable lumbar cushion. Because when we take the lumbar cushion out, what that does is it accommodates the gluteal shelf. It allows the person to sit back in the chair and to get back support and reduces sliding. So accommodation of the gluteal shelf is an essential feature of bariatric seating. The second feature that is really important is angle adjustment at the leg rest and height adjustment at the foot plate. Because what they do is they facilitate limited range of movement due to adipose tissue. It's really important that the feet are loaded. And sometimes with their bariatric client, they're not able to get enough flexion at the knee in order to load onto a foot plate. So if you have a variable angle leg rest, you can load the feet. It allows for loading of the feet and the seat and foot rest width are always considered together. So if you have to increase the width of the chair, you must increase the width of the foot plate. So again, I will cover this in more detail in a future webinar. So there's, there's a lot to be considered when we're looking at clinical therapeutic seating. And as the clinician, you are the clinical expert. You know your patient's needs, you know the medical context, you know the disease progression, and you have an understanding of the product. But really what you need also is you need someone who knows the product really well, who can tell you the features and benefits and how they adjust. With, and also, you need someone that has an understanding of clinical need to ensure the chair features meet the clinical need. So when we're doing assessment, it really is a joint effort. You as the clinician and your seating therapist as the technical expert on how the chair can be designed and made and set up to meet the clinical needs of your patient. So if you do want an assessment, contact us. We have the full PPE here available. We will ensure safety and professionalism in all our assessments. So if you'd like to contact us at Seating Matters, we'll be happy to come out and carry out an assessment for you. So that takes us to the end of week six. And don't forget, if you have any questions, submit them below. I personally answer them all, so just be patient if I don't answer you right away. The other important thing is you get your certificate at the end of week six by completing the 10 questions at the end of each webinar. If you need help with that, let us know. And also you can repeat these questions, redo them as often as you need to. So you'll get your certificate on the successful completion of all the questions.